Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You may be seated. So I thought I'd begin the new year by reminding us of how much we need true and lasting most of all, persevering community. And that really is only possible through Jesus Christ. We, we can get community in many different ways and forms, and our world does. But whether we're able to get one that lasts through all sorts of challenges and trials, in times of difficulty and joys, that's something that doesn't happen so easily. Actually, not at all. And I hope you'll see this as we look, especially at this passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. First, we're going to look at this concept of a non-persevering community, and then what actually a persevering community does look like. So first, a non-persevering community. Um, There's this problem that the Hebrews writer is addressing throughout this book, and it's this idea that some are not meeting together because of a habit. And whether we realize it or not, habits form without us always recognizing it. If you are a person who bites your nails, you probably don't recall when you first started exactly biting your fingernails. (laughs) Or maybe if you shake your leg, and maybe your mom when you were young said, hey, stop shaking your leg but you can't recall when that actually started. It just starts. And when you first do something, it never seems that bad. It never seems something as though it's wrong or difficult until it becomes truly a habit. I know that for me, when I would um, go on vacation, it's very tempting to, if, if it happens to go over a Sunday, for me, and this is way before we had worship on video or anything, on YouTube or anything, it would be very easy for me to think, oh, it's just one Sunday. We don't have to go. And if you just take off that one Sunday of worship, if you're honest with yourself, you come to realize that the following Sunday, it becomes a little bit more difficult to actually get yourself out of your bed and to get going. Because habits form again, without us really recognizing they're forming. But they are. They're shaping our hearts. And once you get into the habit of something, it's incredibly difficult to break. And so what's happening in the Hebrews community is that the people of God, the church, they, for whatever reason, stopped meeting together. And slowly but surely, they got into the habit of not meeting together and became a lot easier to not meet together. That should sound familiar to many of us because for the past couple of years, we got into the habit of not meeting together. But you might say, no, we, we've been meeting together at least online. I don't know exactly what your online worship experience was like, but think of this as anecdotal there is a lot of reports coming from different various people. Initially, perhaps, in March of 2020, you maybe got dressed in what you ordinarily would come on Sunday. Maybe you did with your family. You said, come on, kids, we're going to get up. We're going to actually get dressed up. And maybe you spent that time in that second Sunday of March getting all your kids together, having breakfast, and then dressed up, and you're standing when we say, hey, let's all stand and rise. Maybe you stood, and then maybe you sat. Maybe you sang. That was good for maybe a a Sunday or two, but slowly but surely, maybe no longer would you dress up. Maybe you just end up in your pajamas. You still have bed head. You roll out of bed. You just make it, or maybe you'll come five, ten minutes late. Even at home, you're five, ten minutes late. You roll out, and you're, you're sort of getting the sleep out of your eyes. You're yawning throughout. That's your second, third, fourth Sunday. And by the time it's one month, two months later, just not watching anymore. 
just decide it's, it's not the same. And we give up. We give up meeting together. This is the challenge that we have, not just because of the pandemic, but this has been ongoing for so long. Again, this is being written pretty much in the first couple of decades, perhaps after Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, rose again. And so even in the earliest stages of the church, there are many people who are deciding, I just don't really think I need to be there. Now, recognize that it's not always about safety either. The reality is that to be a Christian in the early church was very dangerous. And there are parts in our world where to be a Christian is also very dangerous. Because while there might not always be a virus, there are definitely authorities and different structures of police or military that have decided, or political structures that say, if you are a Christian, you will be hunted down and the church will be destroyed. And so it's not about safety. Rather, it's always about the habit. The habit is the greatest danger to the gathering of God's people. Not authorities, not a virus, habits. And so recognize that this is really a great hindrance to our gathering. There are also other factors. I wanted to also list a few other factors. One internal with the habit alongside with some external factors that makes persevering in communities such a challenge. First, legalists. Legalists make gathering together very difficult. And this is an internal problem. Much more, it's, it's really an evil that takes place inside the church. And the reality is, it's in all of our hearts. Not a single person is immune from legalism because legalism is the idea that I, myself, have a certain moral, ethical, any type of standard that says, this is what is how things should be. And I'm going to apply that standard to every person around me. And so that means that if I believe something is right or wrong, not based on God's word, but just simply within my own system of what is right or wrong, I'm going to judge you or critique you based on that standard. And that's in all of our hearts. We have our own idea of what it means to be, quote, a Christian, to be moral, to be good, to be just. And more often than not, we look much more to our own idea and experience of what is right or wrong than we do God's word. And so therefore, if it's, well, you are playing cards late at night on Saturday, so therefore you're really not a good Christian. I mean, and I apply that standard to you, suddenly I've determined what faith looks like, what it means to be a believer, what it means to be someone who truly walks with the Lord. That's a very, very minute example. But we all have that. And we all have this idea of what it means to be truly a faithful believer of God. That actually is destroyer of our community. Because eventually, we start evaluating everybody on that, and schisms happen. No one likes to be put under that type of microscope. And so therefore, we start disintegrating as a believing community. We don't persevere to the end. That's an internal wickedness and evil that happens all around in every church, in every person, Christian and non-Christian. That's just the reality of a human being. But there are these external factors that actually causes people to not persevere to the end as a believing community. One is something that is relatively, it sounds newer, but it's actually pretty old. It's called deconstructionism or deconstructionists. And perhaps you've heard of this. Actually, the reason why I know it's not something new is because John brings it up in 1 John 2, 19. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all are not of us. That is to say that there are these people who are in the church. Maybe they were in children's ministry and they went to youth ministry. 
Then they were involved in the church and they did all these things. And then suddenly somewhere along the way, they have decided this is an, a decon- like they start deconstructing their faith. They start examining, wait a second, was this all a product of brainwashing? Is it just something that I just went along with the tide of things and therefore I just got swept up in it all? And then there's this coming out party and this idea that I'm not going to exist in this type of subculture. I'm going to break free and I'm going to make sure that everybody in the world knows. The reason why this is somewhat new, even though it isn't, because in the past we called it apostasy, an apostate, someone who abandoned the faith or left. Um, Again, John is bringing that up here. What's new is that we have something called social media. And so in social media, now there's this grand announcement that says, this is what I am, this is who I believe, and I've been sucked up into this subculture, and now that I've seen the light, I want everyone to know that this is all a sham, the bunch of anti-intellectual zealots who've sucked me in, and now I want the world to know that I'm free, and you need to be free too, and you need to make sure that you follow my path. It often comes with that idea of whether it's on Facebook, there's this announcement, or on Twitter, or on Instagram, some announcement that says, I'm free. Well, here's the challenge with that is that it, it does break apart the church. It does lead to the possibilities of a person not persevering to the end. Not only are they not persevering, but there's an external force that says you should not persevere as well because you're buying into a, an outright lie and a deception. That's deconstructionism. Now, that's a relatively new one, and it's actually not as influential as you might make it to be. It's influential from a social media perspective, but not necessarily in the church as much. May I say, though, that the next paradigm is much more influential in actually breaking apart community, persevering community, and that's consumerism. The consumerist is out there to attend church for, like I shared, those three Fs, friends, fun, fellowship, right? Now, someone asked me after the time I mentioned this, they said, I came to church because of friends, fun, and fellowship. Is that so wrong? And my answer to them was, no, it's not wrong at all. It's absolutely a wonderful thing to have friends, fun, and fellowship with other believers of Christ. But the joining principle of our gathering is never friends, fun, and fellowship. We're not fundamentally here because of those three. Those are fruits or outflows of our knowing Christ. And what brings us together ultimately is not any of those things. It's actually Christ himself. So if we rely on those things to keep us, then we will eventually falter and we will not persevere in community. Here's the reason why. Because eventually the church won't be so fun. Or maybe you might have a conflict with your friend or the fellowship that you thought that came with programs. And maybe you love well moms because you happen to have a child and you're gathering with all these women. Well, that's for a season that then you have older children maybe, and you decide I'm not going to be part of that group. And then you say, well, what group should I be a part of? What small group? Maybe you really like your small group or your discipleship group or whatever it might be and you just never want to be a part and that that fades it always fades always if you go to church because you want those three f's you become a consumer it's the customer is always right whatever i have determined is best for me is truly what is best ultimately and that's what keeps me going And may I say that to have that type of perspective, it just never lasts. We should not be in a place where our only fellowship is rooted around whether we vacation together, go to the beach together, go snowboarding together, play board games together. If that's what binds us together, then get ready because it will falter and fail. It will leave you behind. There are far too many people who look for this 
end up being disappointed and discouraged and disheartened, so they leave to go find another place where they find it. But what they leave behind often is membership. The reason why we're a member of a church is that it calls us to commitment and why we serve the body and why we sacrificially give because it calls us to persevere not on the basis of simply external things that sort of fade away over time or life stage. Because if we trust in that, when we move on to the next place, just say to ourselves, you know what? I'm tired of serving, tired of being known. I'm going to sit in the back of a large church and I'm going to just receive. I'm just going to consume. Just going to want my feelings or my obligations of saying I'm a Christian and gather with me maybe just one or two different groups of people so I can hang out and be together again with these people. You know, that just does not last. And what most of all doesn't last is a heart for and a commitment to Christ. See, if the end goal is a commitment to Christ, then we persevere because if the church is believing that, Regardless of the ebbs and flows of all of the challenges that come with being a believer of Christ, we still say, yeah, but we're here because of Jesus. I know that we things all, don't always go so right, but I'm here because of Christ, and I know you're here because of Christ, and in the end, that's what draws me. That's what keeps me. That's what helps me to persevere. But if, you, if there's any other reason at all, you will jump from place to place, church to church, fellowship to fellowship, never finding. You'll find it for a season and then you'll be looking because it'll falter and fail again. You'll look for the next one. But what you will not find is your pursuit of Christ, him. Another challenge and external factor in us not persevering are what I would describe as culturalists. These are people who move on every sway of our culture, every shift and turn. Just even in the past couple of years, I think you all know how many twists and turns have been moving back and forth because of culture. I've been, um, you know, I've, strangely enough, I've, I've been watching this series on Netflix on F1, Formula One, racing. I have never been interested in racing at all until I was just watching this. And now I'm really interested in F1 racing. And I you know it's, I have enough hobbies, let alone Formula One. But anyway, you watch this race and you see those race cars racing on these twists and turns, super twists and turns. Well, that's what it's felt like these past two years, being in this race car, driving back and forth, because whether it's on politics, on the pandemic, on traveling, on your families, on life, on health, and all these different things. There's been just so many changes. I think we can all agree to that. And in the midst of that, there's always this inclination to say, okay, what is the church going to say about this topic today? And so current event happens that week, and then your expectation is, what is Sam going to say about this? What is this church, what is Wellspring going to believe about this? May I say that if we were to shift and preach and talk about every twist and turn, you might hear something that you might say, oh, I totally agree with that. Or you might actually say some, hear something and you'd say, I totally disagree with that. If we did that, first of all, we would certainly not persevere as a gospel community. We would split apart. At the very least, we would break in, in, in splinters. And this has happened to the church. The gospel transcends every single topic, shift of cultural norm, every aspect of news. If we can only have the eyes of Christ through the lens of the gospel and interpret everything through that lens, you will hear things that you say, I understand why the gospel is most fundamental, why I need that. So every Sunday, it will be a way station. It'll be a place where you say, praise God, Christ is preached. I can go forth into this world, interact with it, even experience hostility or differences of opinion, 
and still be a means of grace. My friends, that's what you need most every Sunday, not what do we think about ethnicity? What do we think about socioeconomic status, Marxism, cultural Marxism, and all sorts of different you know, factors, philosophies of the world influencing and directing what is said. The challenge is that the gospel is primary. But if we make it tertiary or secondary and something else becomes primary, we will not persevere as the body of Christ. We will not last. We will disintegrate. And you will leave. Maybe some of you will stay and say, yeah, I, I like this bent. But one thing is for certain, certain, you will not last at all as a believer of Christ. Lastly are the antagonists. People who literally hates Christ and the church, and they will do anything they can because they believe that the church has no place in our world. So that, that's the most obvious, and there are people like that. And when that happens and at there's attacks on the church, a lot of times that's physical. Again, that's political or even shows of force in our world. But that's something that has been with us since the beginning of the birth of the church. And we should always expect that that's a possibility. But really, it's consumerism that is actually in our day and age, in this church, in our culture, is perhaps the most dangerous of all. This sedentary apathy that flows out of uh, what are you going to do for me mentality. And then next is the culturalism of our day that tries to shape and form the church so that Christ is lessened and everything else is put at the forefront. This is a lot of opposition, but it's not something that has caught God or scripture off guard as if to say, I didn't know this would happen. Paul writes about it so clearly in Ephesians 6. We talked about it in spiritual battle, that this is a spiritual war. We should expect difficulty and challenge and hardship and opposition to your faith, and the fact that lethargy sinks in, and that your heart, you have to battle it. It is a battle. That's not a surprise to us. It shouldn't surprise us. Sometimes the battle comes from your own family, from people that you would expect who loves you the most, who cares for you the most, but when it comes from that type of close quarter, you just can't even imagine it. But Jesus made it so clear, there will be father against son, daughter against mother, brother against sister. When you follow Christ, the antagonism can come from within and without. Never, ever be surprised by that because Jesus made it so clear, this is a real possibility for us. So that's the non-persevering community. You get the habit. You get all these external factors. You have the internal factor of legalism, all that warring against us. So how do, we, how do we withstand that? The Bible doesn't leave us without hope. In fact, we see the hope clearly in verse 25, this persevering community. And so how do we persevere? Look at the word that's used to describe this perseverance. That is, let us consider how to stir up Another, way, another word to use is incite, provoke, throw a fit, get worked up, have riot, tantrum. I mean, it's very much a move, you know, get, get like, so passionate about this. So how do you do it? I mean, you riot when and people incite riots by taking lethar lethargic, apathetic people. And how do you get people who are in their pajamas, watching, not really concerned about what they're watching. And how do you get them to say, we gotta to meet together, we got to move? Well, it takes a stirring up, a rioting. And how do we get that to pursue, people to pursue community together? It's definitely not going to be easy because you're dealing with apathy and passivity. Notice Hebrews doesn't say, stir up love and good deeds in your heart. Because it's not about you. That would actually just make you consumeristic again. As if to say that you can do this all within yourself and it's all for you. The goal is 
how do you consider how to stir up one another? And if it were just about our passion to love and good works, it's impossible to do that alone. You need community and the body of believers to actually make this happen. If you're alone or with one or two people who are exactly like you and don't have any inkling for Christ, well, that's not, this is not something you can do then. You actually have to be in the thick of it. There's a book um, that I read a while ago. It's called Lone Survivor, and it you know, tells the story of the Navy SEALs. And, and Navy SEAL training, one critical element of it is to get them to work as a team. Because they know that if they do not work as a team, not only will the mission fail, but they will die in the process. So this instructor tells the Navy SEAL recruits, if you guys don't start pulling together as a team, none of you will be here. They know that without this togetherness, there's only death at the end of it. This is exactly the same warning that Hebrews gives. The whole book gives this warning. I'm just going to give you two, but there are many throughout Hebrews. Hebrews 2.1, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Notice the, uh, the pronoun we, first person, plural. We, lest we drift away from it. We must pay closer attention. Chapter 3, verse 12, take care brothers, plural. That means brothers and sisters. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you, and that's a plural you, leading you all to fall away from the living God. So many others. The point of it is that we are together because if we are not, we will fall away. We'll fall away individually and together. The body will break apart. And as an individual, I will turn from Christ. If I am not regularly meeting together, I will turn from the Lord. And it doesn't matter who it is pastor, missionary, um, elder, who, no matter who you are, if you are not meeting together regularly, you will turn away from Christ. The habit of not meeting together is not about simply hanging out with a bunch of Christians. Because if you spend time with a bunch of believers and you never talk about Christ at all, like he's not a, he's not a part of you're gathering. I'm not saying in every second when you're playing board games, you have to suddenly bring up Jesus. But there should be this ability to move from playing settlers with a group of people and then saying, hey, what do you think about Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25? And that should not be odd. If a bunch of Christians find that talking about scripture and playing board games or vacationing together, whatever it might be, is odd, then there's a, a real problem with your fellowship of believers because it's not truly fellowship. It's hanging out socially with a group of people. Again, there's nothing wrong with hanging out socially with a group of Christians. But if it can never switch over, because I, I do believe this, is that when your relationship with people, even if they're Christians, and in that relationship, you never talk about Jesus. Well, once you start talking about him, it becomes so strange and so weird that you think, I just can't do it. We've gotten into the habit of not talking about Christ. It's, you have to make it a habit to talk about Christ, even with your family, your friends, so much that it's never weird. It's never strange. That's the same with talking about anything with your family talking about boyfriends and girlfriends with your children, where if you don't ever, if you make it odd or strange or uncomfortable, talking about anything to do with sex with your children as they're getting older and you're, you know, <laughs> you're hiding or that awkwardness makes it difficult and suddenly you can't talk about serious things with your children. It's the same idea. You have to be able to talk about the Lord with anyone around you, especially believers of Christ. Now, notice, first of all, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25, it gives no quarter for exception. We are all possibly able to be in the habit 
of meeting, not meeting together. So again, if it's me or you, don't think to yourself, well, that's not me. I'll never be in that place. When you're retired, maybe when you think to yourself, well, I'm serving the Lord now, but there's going to be a season where I, I'm just tired. I need a break. Breaks are good if you're intentional about it. But once you become unintentional about it, that break turns into the falling away, the drifting away. And so every one of us, if it's, I'm, I've been ministering for 50 years as a pastor, I retire and I go live in Florida somewhere. And so Sue and I are now living in Florida, living in this small little house somewhere. And it's Sunday, comes along and suddenly I say, you know, I just, I'm now 85 and it's just really hard for me because my bones hurt and I, I just don't feel like going to church on Sunday. Let's just, I, God will understand. I did it for 50 years. He'll totally, he could, I, I banked that. <laughs> I've deposited all of that. So that's enough good credit for me to be able to miss a few Sundays. That one idea and thought does not come from nowhere. That is my heart and the enemy coming together and saying, you've banked that for 50 years. You don't need to spend time with God's people. Or I'll be going and I'll say, I don't need to be a member of a church. I'm 85 years old. I, it's so hard for me. And it, you know, it's no, everyone's 20 and I'm 85 and my wife's 84 and we don't belong. And so we'll just sit in the back and leave and, and God will understand. Church will understand. And I live my isolated self. I tell you the temptation, not just simply to not meet together, but to leave the Lord is real. I give you this example because I want you to know that this is a possibility for me, for me. And this is a possibility for the Apostle Paul. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, after I beat my body and make it my slave, I myself might not be disqualified from the prize. He gives that little last qualification because his whole point is to say, it is possible for him to be disqualified from the prize if he doesn't focus and continually press on and persevere to the end. And so we have to be aware that habits come very easily without us recognizing it. That's the point of habits. You don't even realize you're shaking your leg until someone says, hey, you're shaking your leg. Your mom says it. Stop doing that. Or my mom used to say, like she would often say, hey, can you close your mouth? You're a, a fly is going to go in there because maybe I was walking around going, you know, with my mouth open. And so that would be my mom. She'd always say, close your mouth. Fly is going to go in your mouth. And I'd say, I didn't even know my mouth was open. You know, so this is the point of a habit is it happens without you knowing it. Until you become aware of the habit, then you realize, uh-oh, something has to be done. Now, what keeps us from this habit? What is the encouragement about Consider how to spur up, stir up one another to love and good works. That is the opposite of not neglecting to meet together. The opposite of getting into that habit of not meeting together, encouraging one another, stirring up one another. There are many different effects of that stirring up. I'm not going to have the time to bring up all of them, but I'll bring up two. The first, the how do we consider is serving, service, ministry. Stir up one another to love and good works. That makes sense in the sense that it defeats our naturalistic tendency towards comfort and consumerism because it's consumerism is, this is all about me. You're there to serve me. Church is there to serve me. People are there to serve me. And as long as I get fed, everything will be okay until we realize that even though we're, quote, getting fed, we're not fed at all. We're disintegrating in our faith because true feeding comes in ministry and service. I know this. You know your physical body is like that. You cannot just simply eat and eat and eat without an outflow or else you will get a heart attack and die. So eating on its own, no matter how good the food, it won't lead to a healthy body. 
you need to actually exercise. You need to exercise that body or else it will not be healthy. It'll be imbalanced. Well, scripture so wise. Paul uses that same metaphor in 1 Corinthians 12, that the exercising of our body, or as Hebrew says, that our goal is to consider and encourage how to stir up one another to serve, to give, to sacrifice, to be faithful to others, to not be consumeristic, to not be someone who simply is saying, it's all about me. And when we have that, it destroys us. But when we press forward and propel others, it's not just me serving too. The goal is not here. Notice it's let us how to stir up one another to love another person. When you see that, it is so exciting. I had shared um, how I had shared with the women uh, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, just different ways to serve. And then the next day, Jen and Olivia um, contact, sent an email to myself and to a couple of people and said, we're interested in leading wall moms. You have to understand, we haven't had wall moms in like two to three years. And it was a legacy that Terry Kim started way back when we were in San Leandro. And it's been ongoing all throughout. And so during this pandemic, we sort of stopped that. And we, you know, when we'd have staff meetings, we'd always say, oh, it would be great if someone really had this desire. And then when I got that email, it just, I just, we all started praising God. You know, it's one thing if I said, hey, everyone, I'm going to lead well moms as a ministry. I could do that. And I don't know if any women would come, but I could do that. It's another thing to have for me to say, hey, Jen, Olivia, can you do this? And I could do that too. And they would probably say, sure, maybe not. I don't know. But it's another thing to consider how I can, through the gospel, and I didn't even talk about wall moms. It was just, you want to serve in little ways. Those little ways make dramatic impact. And then two people respond to a gospel call. And then from that, they're trying to think about how to stir one another up. That's the body of Christ. That's how we grow together. It has nothing to do about me saying, we need this, we have this need. It's people hear about Jesus. They, they love him and they say, I want to follow him and how can I be used? And we need a lot of people, not just to serve, but to be people who are thinking about considering how to incite, provoke people to serve other people. And if we can get that, even our communities, the world will be changed. Our church will be changed and we will persevere. Another thing is you can do this in your own homes. Do not let your children just be consumers, passive consumers. Think this is really a, a deadly scourge to families is that we as parents believe that our greatest goal and task as a parent is to somehow cater to our children's every need and to provide them everything that they need so that they never have any worries, they never have to sacrifice, they never have to give of their time or their efforts or their energies. And that all they need to do is study, 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 and make money. Guess what the end result of that is? Consumer. You are creating a consumer. Instead, are you, as a parent, thinking of ways in which you are inciting your own children to actually be someone who is thinking about how do I serve the body of Christ to, so that other people will be encouraged and grow. There are so many ways that people can grow and, and grow dramatically. And the means by which that happens are sometimes it's the most astounding of ways. Like, okay, I have, you all know, I have four children in my family. And yes, we are the pastor's family. So you might think, oh yeah, your kids, they all serve because they're the pastor's family. They have to, that's part of the job, part of the job of being a pastor's family. But I want you to know that, at least I think I don't do this, <laughs> that you could ask them. <laughs> but I never say to them, hey, you need to do this because you're a pastor's kid and everyone's watching. You know what would happen if I did that? They would hate the church and hate me and hate being 
they hate the Lord, actually. And that happens quite often. But what I do do is I always tell them, you know what? Follow Christ. Follow Christ. And as, you, as they do, my hope is that they will grow in their service, in their ministry for the Lord. And so we take them along. We'd say, hey, can you consider, would you consider serving this way? Not because you're a pastor's kid, but because the Lord is, you, know, you believe that the Lord has done this for you. As an outflow, would you consider this ministry? And it's not something that they always love doing or want to do it, but it's something that it is for their soul. See, it's not just about teaching the Bible or telling them you need to do this and do that. It's how do you get them to love the church? And that's what they need to have the most. How do you, the way they love the church is they have to serve it. They have to be a part of it. They have to say, this is my church. I love it. I serve it. And I care for it deeply. So serving is a key way in which we grow together. We all, all we need to do to really know this to be true is look at our Savior. He didn't say, all right, disciples, I've done enough for you. Now it's time for you to wash my feet. Didn't he do exactly the opposite? At, he, for three years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he served them nonstop. And then at the very end of his life, when he was about to approach his most difficult part of his mission, he goes down on his knees, takes on the form of a slave, and washes their feet. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what we are called to as disciples, not because he wants us to be miserable, but actually he knows that the greatest joy that we have is when we see others serving others and we're mutually doing this all around and we're, we're growing together as a believing community, as a serving community that's sacrificially giving. So serving is one way. Second is faithfulness. It means faithfulness. We're not looking for people to get excited for a season. In the life of a church, if you're in enough, you will find there will be a season you'll be excited for it. Maybe a, a small group. There'll be a time of growth. But if you're in long enough, you'll also experience times of difficulty, conflict, trial, disappointment, discouragement. A believing community presses through, forgives, wrestles with the reality that this person is broken and so am I and our personalities not mesh and we had this great conflict. Can we reconcile? A believing community and a persevering community says, I will not give up. I'm not going to give up on you because Christ has not given up on me. But to not give up takes a lot of hard work and pain and sorrow and a lot of swallowing your pride. You, you know that expression? I was thinking about it this morning. Pride is really hard to, if, for those of you maybe who've, who've had a difficulty swallowing aspirin or a big pill, some of you maybe really can't do it. Pride is really hard to swallow. But when we do, the Lord is mindful of us that he's faithful. He's going to bring us through to the end. The only way this is possible, my friends, that all this comes together is not our trying harder because it just won't work. I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't have enough willpower, strength, experience, grace, in myself. I just don't. And there's too much wrong with me and too much wrong with you for us to be together to the very end. Eventually, I'm going to falter and eventually so are you. But this is why our faithfulness is not rooted in our efforts. Look at verse 23 again. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Hold fast without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Do you see the means and the ground? That word for means ground. The foundation upon which we can hold fast this type of fellowship and perseverance and hold fast to our own confession without wavering is not going to be because me and you really get this and try hard. It's going to be because 
He who promised is faithful. And we have the solid rock promise of the cross. When Jesus said, it is finished, he showed us that he makes it possible. He completed the task. He persevered to the end. He makes sure that when it is hard, when we look to him and remember he's done it all, now we can be faithful. Even in our brokenness, we can be. Even when it just doesn't make sense. This is the only means by which we can come together. And so in this new year, there are going to be many temptations to not meet together. Many. A pandemic, laziness, consumerism, conflict, health, bad health, fear, um, inconvenience. May you know that there is grace for you every time you meet. Every time we come together, it is not an accident. It is not a wasted time. The Lord is going to use this to keep you going to the end. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you that when we were not able, you are able. So as we take this communion, may we remember that your blood was shed, your body was broken, Lord Jesus, so that we can have hope in you. And so that we would never, ever doubt that you are with us. We thank you, Father, for your word, for the promises of the gospel of Christ that makes our community, our fellowship, actually able to persevere to the end. In Jesus' name we pray.